Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mary Asham. Thanks for spending some time with us today. One brief reminder, check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith, on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, journalists, Middle East experts, even an astronaut and an NFL player. And watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook at B'nai B'rith International. Well, Judaism is the world's oldest monotheistic religion, but how many of us really understand the nuances of early Judaism and the foundation of what we know as the Bible? Well, joining me today to explore the earliest period of Jewish civilization is Dr. Allison Joseph, biblical scholar and senior editor of the Posen Library for Jewish Culture and Civilization. Dr. Joseph and I will speak about volume one of the Posen Library, which looks at ancient Israel from its beginnings through 332 BCE. The new volume, edited by Dr. Jeffrey Tige and Dr. Adele Berlin, is set to be released later this month. Dr. Joseph is an adjunct assistant professor of Bible and its interpretation at the Jewish Theological Seminary. She earned her PhD in Hebrew Bible and Near Eastern Studies from the University of California in Berkeley, and an MA in Jewish Studies from Emory University. In 2016, Dr. Joseph received the prestigious Manfred Lautenschläger Award for Theological Promise for her work, Portrait of the Kings. She has previously taught at Swarthmore College, Villanova University, and Haverford College, among others. Dr. Joseph, thank you for taking the time to be here today. We're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, as a Bible scholar and someone who focuses on biblical interpretation, what intrigued you most about being an integral part of the Posen Library? And, and how would you describe volume one? So I'll start with describing volume one first. So this book takes us from the beginnings of ancient Israel uh, and moves us all the way to uh, the conquest of Alexander the Great when he sort of conquered all of the um, known world and brought Hellenism uh, to the world. So what we get here is a collection of the biblical text as well as texts from ancient Israel in that same period that perhaps people didn't have access to. So what really intrigued me about this project is first taking these biblical texts and putting them side by side with this other kind of literary evidence, as well as including all sorts of images of material culture, artifacts. Um, and so it became an opportunity to showcase the Bible that, you know, people have access to the Bible in lots of ways. They're it's probably still the bestseller printed book. Uh, you can get it online anywhere. You just look, you know, Google for biblical text. So the fact that we're producing something that reprints a lot of the Hebrew Bible is not particularly innovative. But putting it together with these texts that I think that most people don't have access to, they might not know about that, oh, ancient Israel wrote other things besides what comes to us in the Bible. And here are images of maybe the kinds of implements that they use, uh, think their way of dress. These are, uh, we have some cosmetic, little cosmetic uh, pieces of some kind of bowl, a comb, things like that, that brings real, that really brings the of ancient Israelites to life in a way that you maybe don't get just from reading the biblical text. So the Posen Library describes itself on, on its website. Uh, it's the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. It says it's a vibrant, growing collection curated by leading Jewish studies scholars, which offers unprecedented direct access to excerpts from thousands of primary sources reflecting Jewish creativity, diversity, and culture worldwide spanning biblical times to the 21st century uh, when complete. Uh, why is the anthology format, do you think, the best for presenting uh, the information laid out in all of these volumes, but we're talking about volume one? And what are the advantages in terms of, of what is covered? 
Uh, because the you know the question here is you know do we have is this an encyclopedia or is this something different? So it's definitely different from an encyclopedia. What we have in this anthology is a collection of primary sources. In an encyclopedia, usually you would get set what we would describe as secondary material. Scholars describing things, maybe they would quote from a primary source, but it wouldn't present access to the primary sources themselves to the readers. And the act of anthologizing is hard. Um, and if you spoke with Dr. Tige and Dr. Berlin or the editors of any of our volumes, trying to figure out how to anthologize their time period is probably the thing that takes the most, causes the most angst. How, how can we do this? How can we collect all of this great material? And the reason that it's so complicated is because there's not one great way to do it. There are many great ways to do it. And when you anthologize, you have to make choices. Okay, how, what am I including? How am I organizing it? Am I going to organize it by time period? Am I going to organize it by theme, by genre, by character? So when you have any kind of anthology, there are a lot of choices that have to be made by the anthologizer. And what we've done in the Posen Library is collect text and organize them by genre, which when you deal with the biblical text is very interesting because it pulls biblical texts from throughout the, the biblical canon. So different from where they might appear if you had a printed Bible. But it also means that once you get the whole anthology together and with the publication of volume one, this is the fifth of 10 volumes. So we have half of the anthology published. You have the ability to look at a genre across time. Okay, here's poetry. We're looking at poetry. What's the poetry of the biblical period? And led, how does it compare to modern Israeli poetry that often has biblical themes? Can we see any kind of continuity or is there something interesting about the discontinuity? And so by creating that kind of anthology around an organizing principle, you have this ability to look across time. Let's talk about the Bible. Uh, for a couple of thousand years, Jews have been reading the Hebrew Bible. Are there, are there new ways to read it in the 21st century? And how are age-old texts being interpreted differently now? Sure. There's a lot. Well, so the Bible has always been a part of um, Western culture. Uh, it's often in our American culture. It's often misused in, I think, our political landscape. Uh, we see all sorts of things in the news about how to read the Bible. But one of the things that we're trying to do uh, with presenting this material in the Posen Library is trying to see what is the context that presented this? What can we learn about the ancient, Israel, ancient Israelites who produced the Bible? What can we learn about their daily life? Can we see any, um, what is the influence that the Bible has had? And it's really kind of a question of why did we start this anthology of Jewish culture and civilization in the biblical period? If really these people most precisely were not Jews, it's only at the very end of the period of volume one that volume one covers that we can uh, really call these people Jews. They were ancient Israelites. So it is a question of okay, why are you starting Jewish culture and civilization with people who weren't Jews? Their Judaism doesn't look anything like what we've known uh, Judaism to develop into. But on the other hand, how could you not start an anthology, anthology about Jewish culture and civilization with the Bible and you know the, the civilization that produced the Bible? Because at least... For Judaism, Judaism looks to the Bible as its origins. These are the foundational stories that um, influence the way that Judaism develops, the way that Jewish ritual develops. If you think about, you know, we're only a few weeks away from Passover, right? In the Bible, we have the original Passover. The original Passover didn't look anything like what Passover looks like today, but we, the way that's developed through the rabbinic period and into 
you know, our modern interpretations of how do we, how, how are we Jewish? How, what is Judaism and what is Jewish culture and civilization? It looks back to the biblical period. And so by creating an anthology that presents these texts in not a prescriptive way without the, a theological perspective, that it's just here, here, here are the texts and we are cataloging them by genre and we're showing the other texts that came from the same, same time period, putting them together, that it, it, it just presents the material for the readers to interpret rather than an editorial or rabbinic type interpretation. Well, specifically, uh, tell us about some of the characteristics of uh, Jews who lived in the earliest centuries before the, the common era, um, and how were their traits and their faith? How did, how did that change over time? So the ancient Israelites in many ways were influenced by the other cultures of the ancient Near East, right? It's been um, and for 200 years or something since they found um, the great epics of Gilgamesh and everybody was sort of up in arms and said, oh, the Mesopotamians had a flood too. Well, the Mesopotamians had a flood first. Um, and then we have a text with a flood. So certainly we we see the influence of the Mesopotamian culture, both in uh, what the Israelites took from that culture, like a flood narrative, um, but what they push against it. So, for example, um, the worship of one God, right? We see that in the ancient Near East, there was lots of different gods that were uh, part of the worship system of these cultures around Israel. And we see even over the development of the Hebrew Bible that there wasn't a very strict sense of monotheism from the beginning. They, they seem to recognize that other gods existed or uh, the God of Israel that in our oldest passages that the God of Israel was acting like the gods of the other peoples, the warrior gods, thunder gods, things like that. And then we see over the course of these texts, a sort of development of the theology. And so we see that sort of develop in the way that then comes into what we think about Judaism today. But I don't think that these Israelites spent a lot of time talking about religion or thinking about religion the way we do, a separation between religion and other parts of their lives, or even within genre, separating, say, oh, this really is fiction and this really is history. I don't think they took our modern, they thought about these categories the way that we do as modern people to sort of determine like, oh, well, you know, you need to put it in that section of the library because that's really history and you have to put it here because that's really fiction. I think that it all just sort of blended together. They weren't as concerned with these kind of categories that we no, are. Religion, no, but it was, but it was much more central to their daily sure. life. Yes. Than it would be to to most of us. Sure, and what, what, you know, what, what, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to suggest one of one of the great pieces we have is that it it's a image of a non-Israelite text from um, from Mesopotamia. That is a that it's an idol mouthwashing ritual, and the reason I think it's so great is because if you think about the monotheism that develops from the Bible, right, and the Ten Commandments, you shall have no idols, and if you think about the midrash, the story about uh, the Abraham as a boy going into his father's shop and smashing all the idols, I think it's easy for us to say, well. How could these people think that the idols were really gods? You know, if you're, I, I think that it's hard for us to think about. So this image of the mouthwashing ritual text basically is something after a guy would make the idol, they would do this ritual that would basically animate it, make it come alive. Because how could idol worshipers worship something that they had just created, right? I just 
you know, made a project and I formed it out of clay. And now I'm going to say that's a God. So that I think is hard for us to even kind of understand. It seems almost silly. But here we have um, this text that shows a ritual of how you would sort of imbue divineness or something onto the the thing that you had just created. So what are the what are some of the key events uh, in this period that might be uh, familiar to our listeners? Sure. Well, we start at the very beginning. If you want to talk about key events with the creation and the flood. But if you want to get into uh, more kind of historical events, it brings us through the destruction of the temple and the exile from Jerusalem in, by the Babylonians in the um, in the sixth century, and we start to see the development of diaspora communities in Egypt and Babylonia uh, that are you know once they get exiled from the land of, of Israel. So that is a key historical moment. We also see the development of the monarchy, right? Starting from um, the Davidic monarchy, and then we have two, the split of the kingdoms. We have the Northern Kingdom, which encompasses 10 Northern tribes, and then the Southern Kingdom with the remaining two tribes. And so uh, we see all these, all of these sort of historical moments that then influence uh, what happens. It's kind of the period after the Hellenistic conquest that we really see the development of the diaspora and people sort of uh, Jews moving kind of all over the known world um, in a way that we didn't see, I would say, in the early part of this period. Now, you mentioned uh, artifacts uh, of this period. What do those artifacts of early Judaism show us about a daily life in ancient Israel? Religious practices or household tasks, uh, architecture. Uh, tell us about what, what those objects tell us. So we have collections of both reconstructions and images of archaeological sites of houses. It gives us a sense of how people were living. It was very typical in the early part of this um, period in the Iron Age for people to live in a four room, they would call it a four room house because it's exactly what it sounds like. It was a structure that seemed to be, have four subdivisions. We have collections of pots uh, at that time, which tell us both, you know, the kind of things people were cooking with, but also tells us a little bit about um, the kind of trade and interaction they had with neighboring people. So it was very common to find Phoenician pots all over. So it just meant that the Phoenicians who were living sort of on the the coast of the Mediterranean, they were their wares were coming into Israel. It was, it was we have ton, we find tons and tons of that kind of stuff. So it's nothing to write home about, but it means that they these were the usual things that people were using. We have all sorts of kind of regular things that we I mentioned before, a uh, handheld mirror, a comb, cut some kind of cosmetic implements uh, that people were, you know, it's it, sometimes it's hard to remember that the people of the Bible were regular people, right? We try to think, we try to think of them, oh, you know, this is the beginning of Judaism, this is the beginning uh of Western religions, but there also were really real people. And so by, by sharing the artifact, you get a sense of, oh, these were people and they lived in houses and we see different kinds of um, tombs diff that demonstrate different kind of burial practices that they had. Um, and we see that they used, you know, regular things for cooking and for adornment and um, things like that. Let's talk about adornment for a second. I mean, how how was art expressed? We just read, I think it was last week in the parasha about Bitzalel and um, all of the, the very clear instructions about um, uh, decoration. And yet we have a prohibition against uh, uh, creating uh, images. 
human images. So how was that art expressed? When you talk about adornment, uh, what, what would we see if we walked in into a typical four-room house? So we have very limited examples of anything that you would sort of describe as art from ancient Israel, not just sort of what we've collected into this volume. There are very limited examples of painting, whether that means people didn't decorate their homes with painting or it just didn't survive, that we don't really know. Uh, but the four-room house, it was often made out of mud bricks and it had minimal adornment. One of the things that we have tried to do is find places where we could see examples of ways people dress. So for example, we have these tremendous Assyrian reliefs. One in particular, we have a number of images from the relief um, from the Battle of Lachish, where the Assyrians really kind of crushed the Israelites. And the goal of it is to kind of memorialize the victory. But if you try to look at it a different way, you can say, oh, these guys are wearing this kind of outfit, a tunic with a belt and a hat. And these guys over there, they're using a slingshot. So we can see that a slingshot or think about David and his slingshot was really something that you would spin around your head rather than kind of a Dennis the Menace sort of, you know, that Y stick with the, the rubber band. So, so that you have, even though the goal of this huge relief from the palace of the Assyrian king was to memorialize or immortalize the victory, you have an opportunity to say, oh, these are depictions of people, right? So what did they wear? What did they do? What, you know, what kind of weapons did they have? So we're kind of limited in what is left, the record that is left behind, but we try to gather what information we can. But we hear a a number of descriptions in the Bible about jewelry. Right. Uh, so uh, decorative, the decorative arts must have been focused on on those kinds of things, would you say? Yes. Yeah, so we included a collection of beaded necklaces, so different colored beads, things with silver, just kind of typical uh, objects of adornment, I guess. And we f- we find them kind of all over and we've we've included them so people could get a sense of that. We've also included a number of objects that maybe are ritual objects. We, there are a number of little um, clay figurines. So some of them we might know from the other cultures. Um, for example, there, uh, there are a lot of these figurines that have, it's a figure of a woman with protruding breasts that was often thought to be some kind of fertility amulet or something. We don't really know what people were doing. Certainly, if you read the Bible very strictly and it says don't have any images and don't have idols, uh, you have to wonder what what were these people doing with that? Were they violating that law? Did they not really know about it? Or were they using these figurines for some other purposes? Which there is a disconnect between the written record and what we find of the artifacts. The artifacts require a lot of interpretation. Well, tell us a little bit more about the Bible. The arrangement of the Bible, is, is everything chronological? That's a good question. In the Hebrew Bible canon, it's not completely chronological. In the Hebrew Bible is organized into three separate parts. The first, the five books of Moses, that does follow some kind of I guess, narrative chronology from the creation of the world until uh, the arrival of at the ed, right at the promised land. So we get that kind of narrative chronology with sort of short, short diversions to tell us all the very, very, very boring laws about how to do sacrifices and everything. Um, but then when we get into the second part, the prophet or Nevi'im, we get a collection. The first part is also continuing historical, and it takes us where the Torah left off with the succession of um, Joshua 
the conquest of the promised land, and it takes us all the way through the kingship, uh, the kingship monarchy to the the Babylonian exile. And then following that, we have the collections of the prophets, which are not necessarily in chronological order. We have the major prophets and they are major, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, mostly because their books are long. The minor prophets are very short um, and often might have been written on a single scroll um, and are often referred to as the Book of the Twelve. So what makes the major prophets major is that they had very long books compared to the minor prophets that had short books. And then when we get to the end part of the canon, there's a limited organizational process. So in terms of thinking about the Hebrew Bible as an anthology, it seems to deny that kind of anthologizing principle of, oh, we're going to organize chronologically. We're going to organize by genre. We're going to do something. And it's kind of defies that organization. What you see in um, non-Jewish canons of the Hebrew Bible is that they put some of that kind of catch-all stuff from the writing section of the three-part organization. They put it into what seems like a narrative chronology. So the book of Ruth comes in, the books of Chronicles that talk about they start from the beginning, but they also go a little further than what we see in Kings. So in terms of if you were the editor of the Bible, you would kind of send it back to your editors and say, this is sort of a uh, disorganized mess. And you try to put it together so that someone could read it cover to cover if they wanted to. In volume one, uh, how are spoken and written Hebrew? covered? How do they change over the centuries? And how do you cover that? So everything that we have um, in the Posen Library is an English translation. So in terms of dealing with the actual Hebrew, we, we are not dealing with it that much. We do highlight places where we see the very earliest stratum of, he, of the Hebrew language. So in some... It, Often it's the poetic passages that are probably the the oldest passages from the 11th or 10th century BCE. And then we see that the Hebrew often simplifying comes into prose. Um, In our later texts, we see loan words from other languages, from um, Aramaic, from Persian. In some of the later books, we just celebrated Purim. And in the book of Esther, We have foreign words that are there. They talk about, um, you know, the names of Amon's sons. Those aren't Hebrew sounding names. They they include the different titles of the various officials that are different. Um, And so you can see sort of the development of the language that way in terms of who was the ruling power of the area and what kind of influence did that empire and their culture and language have on the development of Hebrew? What do you uh, learn about the laws of the, of the Torah when you compare them to uh, non-biblical legal documents of the period? How, how does that line up or not align? So I guess there are a few ways that that happens, and they both align and not align. So when you look, so when we include the the legal documents is one of the genres that that we've collected text under, you have some discussion of how they are influenced by the ancient Near Eastern legal documents, like, for example, the Code of Hammurabi. But even within when when you look at the actual texts, you see that there are these extra biblical texts that also tell us about what people are doing. So one that I think of in particular is a legal complaint from a place called Mitzad Hashiv Yahu, which is somewhere between Tel Aviv and Ashdod. And it was written on an ostracon, which is a broken piece of pottery that, you know, they would recycle it. They, they would have a broken pot and they would use it to write on. And so in this document, we have a legal complaint 
from a guy who is working in a field and he's talking about the the taskmaster not returning his uh, collateral garment. So we have a law in Exodus 22 that basically says if you owe someone a debt and you give them your garment as your collateral, they have to return it at night because it's your only garment, right? Maybe it's his jacket or something. It's going to be cold. You need it for the evening. And uh, the law in, Dur- in Exodus 22 tells us that you're supposed to return the garment in the evening. But in this legal complaint from Metzad Hashiv Yahu, we have this complaint that the worker is bringing to some commander or governor, some municipal authority there saying, I measured my harvest. Everybody saw me do it, but the guy didn't give me my cloak back. And so he's appealing to this guy of authority to impose the law to get the guy to give him his garment back. And so we see with something like this, that it uh, confirms what the biblical law was. You were supposed to give back the garment. The worker is saying, you didn't, you're not doing the law. And this guy's violating it. So we see that uh, this was a law that was really in effect, you know, on the ground. I never fail to be amazed, really, when we're, <laughs> we talk about you know, law, which is so well organized today in so many different ways. And to think that in those times that, that these issues would be litigated, and, and when you, you think it, you know, in the context of, of history at that time and the world at that time, um, I, I'm, I'm always impressed to hear uh, even drilling down to the example that you've just given, which is uh, uh, an interesting example. Uh, but I guess by the example, it, it, it sets the rule here that this is how intricate the law actually became or was at that time. I want to just talk about one other thing. Um, I think you cover it in the volume. How does reading Miriam's song next to Deborah's song, possibly the, the earliest examples of, of Jewish rhyme, uh, change how we understand those pieces of, of poetry? So. We, they come together because we've collected them under the genre of poetry. So the Song of Deborah comes from Genesis, uh, Judges 5 um, in the middle part of the Bible. It's sort of in this middle history after they get in the promised land, before the beginning of the monarchy, we, um, the Israelites were ruled by judges. So we have this poem sung by Deborah, attributed to Deborah. Um, So from the middle of the Bible. And then we also have the song, the song at the sea, which is sung by Moses, followed by uh, Miriam and her song from, from Exodus 15. So first, you know, this is the new kind of anthology. You're pulling these two pieces from all over the canon, and now you're putting them together. And we put them together as the first two examples with under the genre of poetry because they are among the oldest passages within the Hebrew Bible. We have a number of other poems that maybe are not quite as old, but the, the language attests to their the ancient quality of, of the language. So you pull them together, which you might not have read them through if you were just going to the canon. And you see that they are both. Um, a victory song, right? This is praising God for saving us at, in, you know, after they leave Egypt, they get to the Red Sea. What are they going to do? It splits. They, you know, hurry through. And then on the other side, Moses and the Israelites sing the song of jubilation and Miriam leads um, the women in song and dance. So you have this moment of victory over the Egyptians in which the people are praising God. And so for the person who collected these texts into the Hebrew Bible, they found this to be important enough to preserve this old fragment. And I would think emotional enough that they wanted to add it to what comes before, right? The prose, right? You they went and they crossed the sea and then they got to the other side and yay, everybody's happy. But how do we express yay, everybody was happy? We're preserving this song. 
Same with the song of Deborah. We see that Deborah was a prophet and she sort of leads the victory against the Canaanite army. And after the victory, this song is preserved. So if you read it according to the canon, the narrative describing the battle happens in the previous chapter. But now we have this celebration afterwards. So we get that perspective. Both of these is a victory song. And what's really interesting, I think, is that it highlights the role of this woman. It was very uncommon to have Deborah, a prophet, and really she's acting as the judge of the period, is sort of the hero of the story, even over the Israelite general, and the song is attributed to her. So that is really kind of uncommon. And then you contrast it with, we have this very long song that uh, Moses, Mo, that is attributed to Moses, followed by a very short song that Miriam sings in, in Leading the Women. So we see both this sort of exaltation of Deborah and how significant it is to see that woman, but also, you know, Miriam is somewhat diminished, but we do have to re- remember that it seemed important to include her and to clu- include her song, right? We just had the long song of Moses. We could have gone, keep going. But there is this sort of backtracking of, well, and Miriam led the women in song and um, she has one verse of poetry there. So we, we see sort of both how significant it is for Deborah to be raised up and then also how Miriam is kind of not necessary, even if you're trying to have this jubilation expressed in poetry, but that she is included. Well, just to uh, conclude and go back to volume one, um, how do you see volume one uh, helping people to to read the Bible today in terms of development of of Judaism, the Jewish people, uh, from ancient times to the present? How how can it be a, a guide and how can it assist in that process? So I think that the volume provides several different access points to the biblical material. First, while we're presenting primary sources with limited editorial intervention, the volume contains really a beautifully written introduction that talks all about the Bible and ancient Israel. And each of the genres have their own introduction that talks about What was biblical law like? What was biblical poetry like? That just would give readers some sense of how do we, how should we interpret this? Because it's very different. Biblical poetry is very different from modern poetry. And so uh, it, it, it allows readers sort of access to seeing those significant features of the different genres. It also provides the access to the artifacts. Um, as well as the extra biblical text. So the laws of Exodus might be easily accessible or well-known to people, but would they regularly have access to something like this legal complaint? And so we're providing new opportunities to access the other literary production of ancient Israel that isn't preserved in the Bible. Well, for those looking to learn more about the early period of ancient Israel, the book is The Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, Volume 1, Ancient Israel from Its Beginnings Through 332 BCE, edited by Dr. Jeffrey Tige and Dr. Adele Berlin, and will be available online from the Yale University Press or wherever you purchase books on March 23rd. Dr. Joseph, thank you for speaking with us about your important work helping to paint a detailed portrait of early Judaism and ancient Israel. Thank you. Well, if you're looking for more of our diverse content, visit our website, benebrit.org, to listen to all of our conversations, podcasts, and live interviews. Tremendous thanks to Dr. Allison Joseph for joining me, and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, make sure you never miss an episode by tapping the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Dan Mary Ashen. Talk to you again soon. Take care, everyone.